Okay, so here we are looking at preserving full culture and also looking at sustainability. So uh, full culture is going to be the first thing we talk about, and then we're going to talk about the overall sustainability of certain types of cultures, which obviously plays in with preservation. So this concept of sustainability is something we haven't talked about too much. Uh, we skipped this kind of part at the very end of chapter one because we knew we would add it into later parts of you know this chapter as well as the development chapter, resources, industry, agriculture, things like that. So the idea of sustainability is being able to sustain a culture or an environment in its present condition uh, while also enabling it to survive in the future based on current actions. So when we talk about that in terms of culture, we're talking about not necessarily preserving the acts of culture with the belief systems, but more of, again, um, the physical culture. So that cultural landscape, how do we preserve that? Um, so we're going to look first at, at uh, full culture, and then we'll talk about you know, the overall sustainability of culture in general. All right. So uh, in terms of the challenges to full culture, um, because it, is, it becomes harder and harder to maintain, um, you need cultural landscapes as popular culture continues to advance due to that globalization and diffusion. So again, talking about how so many places, especially in the United States, look very similar to one another in terms of, you know, there's the same gas stations in most places. There's the same, you know, McDonald's, Perkins, hotels, and, you know, same location or similar things. And so um, it kind of becomes really, really hard to maintain a unique sensibility or sense of area um, based on those factors. And again, that diffusion piece is really, really big. So when we talk about, uh, you know, that unequal access to technology, to awareness, obviously is, makes it easier to preserve folk culture, but that becomes harder to do as we become more advanced. All right, so as people are exposed to more popular culture, they are more likely to turn away from their folk culture. Um, that's not always a bad thing. Um, one thing we're gonna mention a little bit here is the caste system in India. Um, but, you know, some aspects of folk culture are not always a positive. Because, you know, you think about, you know, child marriages, um, when w w girls are expected to marry and, you know, um, have kids or expectations of, you know, certain gender roles, um, you know, lack of knowledge, uh, female circumcisions, uh, dowries, you know, those things are not necessarily positive and can actually have negative impacts on a culture as well as just people in general. Um, in terms of that lack of knowledge, I kind of use that as an example within Orthodox Judaism in the sense that, um, you know, Many uh, Orthodox Jews, especially the most, you know, religious and um, culturally conservative would be, I think, the right way. But also they follow the, the laws or the laws of Judaism most um, heartedly. They follow it uh, kind of essentially to what is written in the uh, Old Testament or the Torah. Uh, essentially, um, that's all they really know and all they study. So... Um, you know, people don't really have too much knowledge of the outside world in terms of technology, in terms of other cultures. Okay, it's very, very limited, and that's intentional. Um, and so, you know, when people try and leave the faith, they don't have a whole lot of skill sets, which, you know, that kind of handicaps them from being able to do other things or to pursue other avenues outside of folk culture. So, I mean, that could be considered, you know, again, a negative of terms of, you know, not knowing the outside world. All right. Um, so... Again, this is not always a bad thing either to try to preserve folk culture because for many that is very, very important and their ways of life are okay. You know, one example, you know, take the Amish, right? Um, so, you know, in terms of one thing to preserve Amish culture, um, the Amish essentially don't keep to themselves completely, but I mean, their interactions are fairly limited. Um, and we even have Amish here in Minnesota, you know, further you go down to 52 towards uh, Iowa and Decorah where Luther College is, um, you're going to see signs with uh, buggies. Um, you know, on the sidewalk, you know, or not the sidewalk, but on the side of the road, you know, beware, you know, watch out for uh, carriages and things like that. Um, and you will be likely to find them there. So within Amish tradition, and that's kind of what this is going to bring itself to, when the sons come of age, uh, they're supposed to be given a uh, farm, all right? And land suitable for farming becomes more limited as cities and commercial farms expand and the amount of land is already, um, you know, we always have more land, but who owns it and who can have access to it is very, very limited. So... This would force a lot of Amish people to leave other parts of the country or leave to other parts of the country or banish their Amish culture due to that lack of land and being able to, again, preserve their type of culture. Um, so visually, all right, um, areas that they have to or have expanded in, um, okay, the red dots are areas that are coming into existence after the 90s and then uh, seeing that we're still, that came, at, were existing before 1990 in the green dots and then the black areas are Amish cultures that are 
our Amish communities that have sort of faded away. So you can kind of see, again, right here very heavily in Minnesota, but again, throughout much of the Midwest, you'll find a lot of different Amish groups and communities that still exist or that still exist. Um, and obviously, um, ones that have been expanding into northern Minnesota where there is still more farmland. All right. So Lancaster County in Pennsylvania. So, you know, this is right here. Here is Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, if you know, this side of Pennsylvania is exceedingly uh, heavily populated and the further west, you know, there's more of that farmland. But again, um, that forces them to move further away. So within India and dowry, so again, kind of in terms of a cultural practice that has a very negative impact or can have that negative impact, um, a dowry is a gift from one family to another as a sign of respect, and it's often associated with weddings and marriages. And typically what you hear about in multiple cultures, not just Indian culture, but also within Judaism and a few others, um, is typically the family of the groom, so the man getting married, gives the bride's family a dowry, whether that's money or land or certain gifts, both as a sign of respect, but also to compensate the family for the loss of the daughter. Because in typical terms, what we talk about is, um, you know, the daughter is, you know, an essential part of the family, but also helps provide for the household uh, with work, uh, with, you know, farming, with taking care of the house, bringing in money. And so when you lose her, um, you know, that's one less person to help take care of the household. So you're compensating the family for the loss of that child, essentially because she's going in to marry a new family who she's going to have to devote her time and efforts to. Um, so, as I said, you know, done more than just one culture, but this has been reversed. It's actually become illegal in India, or somewhat illegal, um, because the bride's families are now the ones who are paying the groom's family. So, kind of flipping the script on that a little bit. Um, same thing within Judaism. It's always, you know, or it's usually the uh, bride's family gives over to the groom to say, hey, you know, our daughter, our daughter is uh, worthy, or, you know, sorry. Um, yeah. So it can go actually both ways in terms of who's giving the dowry, but essentially, you know, if the if it's a poor family who's marrying off their daughter, um, this is kind of a, you know, small dowries lead to violence and shows disrespect, um, and that can obviously lead to uh, people getting killed. Um, so one thing to consider here um, is how might popular culture affect the shift from grooms to bride dowries? And also perhaps the end of it. How can Dow, how can popular culture maybe change that? So that is something again to keep in mind uh, going forward. Um, there's an article on folk, Hmong folk culture, especially here in the United States, as the Hmong are uh, one of the biggest uh, immigrant groups here in Minnesota. Um, and that is worth taking a look if you get a chance, but we're not going to have time to do that. So then we talk about the overall sustainability. So we talk about trying to preserve folk culture within the idea of, you know, the Amish here. Um, but we also want to look at just the idea of sustainability in terms of the cultural landscape piece and actually holding on to culture. All right. Um, as we've said, folk culture essentially develops from its environment. It develops because of the climate, because of the unique landscapes, the food that's around, um, the resources that are around it. And they kind of develop from there based, again, on housing, based on clothing. You know, this is the stuff that we've gone over within these videos in the unit. And then popular culture instead imposes itself on the environment and says, it doesn't matter what, you know, was here before. We are going to take the, the culture that is, you know, popular and impose it on the land by making everything look uniform or look similar or by saying, hey, this is a unique thing for us and we think that it's really, really cool. Um, or we feel like it has to go here. So again, you can think about this in terms of some of the examples we're going to find here. All right. Um, because in popular culture, we change the environment to suit our needs, wants, and desires. So this is where we talk about where we build parks, where we, you know, build massive skyscrapers, where we build stadiums, where we build schools and housing. All right. Um, that's us imposing on the land and bringing in other resources or taking things that don't necessarily exist in the natural environment in terms of housing, in terms of plant life, in terms of animals, and imposing that on the environment. All right, taking things that were not necessarily here before and then making a big impact on it. So that can lead to landscape pollution, where we modify the environment with few regards for the environmental conditions, um, and leads to some form of waste. So think about solid cans, uh, you know, bags, uh, trash getting thrown all over the place um, as a result, but also the idea that everything is now looking very, very similar, as we've stated before. All right. So that's what the that's the uniform landscape, not necessarily landscape pollution, but the uniform landscape, right? Um, because we're talking about you know product recognition. So every McDonald's, at least on the outside, looks the same thing. Same thing with White Castles in terms of the design of the buildings, um, you know. And again, that kind of is very similar, um, you know, in terms of again why everything looks the same when you go to these places. 
you know, there's slight differences based on the land available in terms of some sort of unique construction. But for the most part, again, architecture is similar in many cases for, you know, these businesses and locations. Um, and so that obviously hurts the folk culture that exists in those areas. So obviously here's our examples of, you know, the things that we're familiar with. So, and then talking about the golf courses, and this plays in with the um, land and law, or looking for lawns article assignment, um, or that reading, because golf courses are an example of um, both the uniform landscape, but also um, sustainability and how something like golf could actually be a negative, especially in the United States. And the book talks about this a little bit, comparing European courses to American courses, all right? Because uh, golf courses use a lot of land, water, and resources, you know, uh, talking about importing water to keep the greens really nice, um, using pesticides to keep the grass good, uh, keeping weeds out um, for a game that not everyone can play because golf is expensive. You have to rent tee times. You have to have a set of clubs. You have to be able to get to the golf course and have to be able to do that fairly consistently to be any bit decent. All right. Um, so that also depends on where you're living all right, and how you travel to those locations. All right. Um, in many cases, you think about um, the types of grass that is used, the trees that are located uh, throughout these courses, the other features that weren't there um, to fit into uh, it says gold system, it should say golf system. Um, and so, you know, that in itself, you know, changes the environment around. So you think about a place like, you know, California that's constantly having droughts. But if you're using, you know, California and Arizona, but it's like if you're using all this water to keep, um, you know, your grass that you're importing into the area in areas that necessarily, you know, there's things, there are the environments and crops and plants that exist that don't need a whole lot of water to survive. But, you know, if you're imposing with these golf courses um, and you have to keep the greens and all, you know, nice and, you know, well kept, that takes more time and resources to do that. All right. Including, you know, again, what could be sparse water sources um, when there might be droughts and there might be water restrictions for people to, you know, shower and bathe with. But golf courses, you know, have to, you know, they're, they're a big part of that. Um, and then on top of it, land can be used for other things because, you know, we're imposing our part um, for, you know, these expensive private or even public courses that we're still paying for. And, you know, the land can be used for housing. It could be used for growing crops. It could be used for, you know, just recreation uh, that everyone can get to use. So think like other, you know, athletic fields, other parks, trails, things like that. Um, and then there's the effect on, you know, the natural environment in terms of the natural animals that live in those areas. So, you know, deer, rabbits, you know, um, other certain plant life that might have existed before. So there's that impact um, in terms of is this sustainable for the environment based on our types of recreation. So those are things to keep in mind in terms of the preservation piece, but also the sustainability. And is that and that is something we have to make ourselves aware of. So that's where that looking for lawns article really becomes important in terms of, you know, how do we use land in the United States and is that sustainable? Is that something we need to consider changing? So that brings a wrap for the main stuff here within the cultural unit. Um, we're going to do one more uh, video that's on, you know, the idea of ethnocentrism um, and, uh, you know, which is something we'll come back to later with the ethnicity unit, um, but also just being aware of other types of culture and awareness of culture. So that's where we're going to end for today. And then we'll come back with one last video. Um, so yeah, enjoy.